Welcome to the Win Make Give podcast. This is Chad Himes, joined by my friend Bob Stewart. Bob, great to have you here today. Thanks, Chad. Thanks. I'm excited. We got a, we got an awesome guest here. We have a killer guest on on this call here today, and I'm going to get ready to introduce him to to the audience. Well, I'm going to actually have him introduce himself in a moment. Yeah, Bob. I want to tell you how I even came across this guy. And a few years ago, Nita and I, we hired a nutritionist and our nutritionist gave us our meal plan for four months while we were in training for an event and said, this is exactly what I want you to eat. And I got to tell you, every single day, lunch was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But it wasn't just a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on specific bread. Now, I've never really thought that much about bread. Bob, do you really think that much about bread when you go to the store? Well, I mean... No, but I do have a, a kind I like, I guess. And, yeah, and, and kind once you like. I get a sandwich where I'm like, what is this bread? But there you go. I, I think right. only when it's bad bread do you think about bread, right? Okay, good point. So here I am. The, the nutritionist told me to get this specific kind of bread, and he called it Dave's Killer Bread. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, that's not Wonder Bread. That's the only bread that you know I know the name of or my grocery store brand. And he said, no, trust me, it's in your grocery store. And we went in and we got this Dave's Killer Bread. And first of all, Bob, let me tell you, like taste-wise, it's killer. But here I am, I'm reading the bread because I'm like, this is the strangest name of a bread company I've ever heard of. And if you've ever eaten Dave's Killer Bread for anybody in our audience, you've read the package and you've heard the story behind Dave's Killer Bread. Yet if you haven't, oh my gosh, sit down and get ready for a conversation that we're about to have today because Bob, when we sat down and said interview guests for the Win Make Give podcast, even though I've been eating this bread for about three or four years now, I said, I got to get this guy on the podcast because this is one of the most amazing stories, not about second chances, not even about third chances. This is a story about fourth chances. And on top of that, the second chances that come from it. So Bob, I want to introduce you and I want to introduce our audience to Dave Dahl, the creator of Dave's Killer Bread. So Dave, welcome to the podcast today. Hey, it's great to be here. And peanut butter and jelly on uh, good seed is my favorite too. So There you go. All right. Love that. I, I got to say, you know, there's so many amazing flavors that you've got. You know, we won't even get into that on this call. Dave, I like to let our guests introduce themselves to our, our world so that they get to say it how they want about who they are. Tell our audience, other than what I've just said about bread, who is Dave Dahl of Dave's Killer Bread? First thing I want to say is I'm very grateful. Um, 50, 50, how old am I? 57 year old guy. Um, you know, the first half of my life, I would say, because it's say I lived to be 75. The first half of my life was uh, just drugs, crime. Uh, well, before that, it was depression suicidal thoughts. Uh, growing up as a child, I was a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, that's the way I was taught and went to Seventh-day Adventist schools and church. And I basically followed all the rules until um, I became disenchanted, disenfranchised, uh, stopped believing what I was told. And then I really got lost because that was everything. You know, once I, once I realized that everything I thought was was up was actually a lie, or I thought it was. Well, you know, I I can't say it's a lie for sure, but that was my impression. Uh, and then I was in trouble because I didn't have a uh, moral compass or a foundation. Really, I still was a pretty decent kid, you know, but um, I just got into a lot of trouble. And my teenage years were were quite a bit of just. Um, wandering around and getting into one little thing after the skirmish or whatever after another uh getting arrested here and there not a lot i was i didn't have a really i didn't have a felonious uh youth until i was about 22 and that's when i um took my i shot my first injection of methamphetamine and what that taught me was that you can change how you feel (laughs) Uh, all the other drugs I've done, it never made me feel that good. In other words, it was like the first transformation in my life. Um, it wasn't a good transformation in the long run, but it sure seemed like it. It opened my world to a lot of things that I just didn't know I could feel. And uh, the, the problem, though, is I, I became addicted to that as far as 
um, when it comes psychologically addicted. And I, I took, you know, I, I wanted it so much that I had to have it. I was working for my family when I took the injection that first hit. Um, and I kept working, but eventually staying up all night and you know doing things kind of led to me to that not working out. Plus I was, um, I was going out and my first crimes were jockey boxing and, and little petty burglaries. And uh, jockey boxing is when you uh, break into a car and, and steal a stereo or something. So uh, I did those things. Those were my petty crimes at first. And I eventually ended up going to prison the first time for burglary. Um, and then I got out. I, I, did, I was sentenced to seven years back in the day when there's when seven years didn't mean seven years. It meant, uh, in my case, nine months because I was a first timer. So I did well. I did nine months, and then I did seven months uh, in and out, um, like work release sort of thing. So then, um, you know, I get out, and I'm like, okay, I still wanted that dope. Uh, that was the only way I was going to be all right. And I kept doing, uh, so I started dealing it, but I wasn't very good at dealing it in those days. And I just kept, I ended up having to do little petty stuff, little petty crimes and stuff. Uh, finally, I, I was on a warrant for a burglary. I had a warrant for a burglary and uh, I decided to take off cross country. I got busted in uh, Wyoming with a stolen van, a uh, quarter pound of really, really bad weed. And uh, because the weed was so bad, they just gave me a misdemeanor for it. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, man, this, this ain't even worth doing a crime for. But they uh, they chased me down in my in the van. And uh, so I did 90 days there. Lost about 20 pounds, even though I was kind of skinny when I went in there because they didn't feed me much. And uh, so anyway, I, I, after the 90 days was up, I took off to... To Massachusetts, uh, which is where I was intending to go from the start, because I had a buddy over there who, who was working construction, and he said he could get me a job. So I was heading three thousand miles away to Massachusetts, and uh, when I got there, the day after I got there, he decided to quit quit his job, and we started doing armed robberies to uh, to pay for our cocaine and heroin, uh, little cocktails we were doing. They call them speedballs. And it wasn't long before, I, when I was doing a robbery or two a day, you know, I, I was I was bound to get in trouble at some point. And I did. I was in I was in Massachusetts a total of eight days before I got uh, busted for armed robbery. Uh, went to, went to jail, and they I was in a holding cell for a couple of days, and. Uh, they wouldn't feed me. They didn't like me very much. And they just wouldn't give me anything to eat. So they said, well, we don't feed armed robbers. So, you know, you're screwed. And then I called them. I said, you, you know, I called them some bad names. You guys got, you guys got to feed me. And they pulled me out. Four of them beat the living crap out of me with sticks. And then there's big old steroid you know, dude got me in a chokehold and instead of putting me to sleep, he, uh, it just started bleeding and the blood started pouring out like a geyser in front of my mouth. So, I mean, I, in those days, I thought that just came with the territory. Um, uh, that that was just, it, cause I got beat up so many times by cops, but that was the worst one. And then, um, finally, okay. So I did my four and a half years there and make a long story short. Uh, because it's, it's such a long story, but ended up getting out, uh, going back to Portland, getting arrested again within a few months for uh, unarmed robbery. And uh, did a couple more years, and then finally I was out for about a year. Became a really, really, I would say, a, a successful drug dealer. But uh, it's not successful when you go to jail. So I uh, I got arrested five times in three counties that year. And so I had five five separate felony cases in three counties. So it was just like, because I kept getting out on bail. I, I had pretty good resources because I was doing pretty well, you know, as a dealer. 
finally got busted. Uh, high speed chase, wrecked my car, uh, got tased and smacked around a little bit, uh, pepper sprayed, and then they took me in. I was just, that was it. And from that point on, I was just, you know, my life's over. I'm, uh, God, I can't remember how old I was. I was 34 at the time. And they eventually told me that you either plead to 10 years state, and, and this is approximately 10 years because it's uh, combined beefs, or the feds want to take you armed career criminal, which is 15 plus five years for the gun beef. I could do 20 years feds or 10 years state. And everybody wants prefers feds, but uh, not at 10 and 20. So I, uh, I ended up doing seven and a half years on that. And halfway through, halfway through that seven and a half years, approximately, I had been on a list for this computer aided drafting program. Um, which I had, I didn't even know what that meant. You know, I didn't even, I've never been on computers, let alone uh, during drafting or really thought about it. And uh, at the same time, I had been super depressed, miserable. Uh, you know, I thought that life was just that way. I didn't know that I could do anything about it. See, uh, the first thing I finally did about it was I dropped a kite, which is an inmate communication form, into the box asking for help from psych services. I went to uh, a couple, well, I don't know how long it took me to get in there, but they gave me a medication that almost, that worked almost immediately for me. Um, it just helped me stop going down these negative paths in my mind. It just helped me make it, I was able to choose a positive th thoughts. And then I went to the drafting course and I was intimidated for a week. And then I started killing it. And it was just an eye opener. I, I realized that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm a decent guy. I'm not, I don't have to be this other guy. And it was the beginning of my, my next transformation. I had, I had had a transformation from, you know, depressed guy to dope, to dope guy, criminal. And now I was transforming to some, somebody that I, loved i loved being um and i i did i just started knocking out of the park uh you know, everything i was doing in in cad i became a tutor and a project drafter and uh eventually got kicked you know i, I didn't like it because i i was really happy doing what i was doing but they and i thought i was going to take that route to the next uh whatever wherever it led me but Instead of doing 10 years, they were going to let me out a couple of years early because they'd sent me to this drug program. If I got through this drug program, I would get out a couple of years early. And, and I did. And I decided that I would ask my brother if I could come back to work there. And that's something I'd never, <clears throat> I never wanted to do. Uh, I mean, I, I had given up on that idea entirely. I, I thought that I would never even consider that again. But because of the drafting and the mindset that I learned in drafting uh, and everything else that I was learning, I, I realized that I could be a great asset to the, to the family business. So uh, my brother, I think he, he recognized that too. And we agreed. I got out, started working, making $12 an hour, <clears throat> 40 hours a week. Um, this was 2005. And but but then I was working another 30 or so hours a week working on new products. And uh, I just, I was scared to death of trying to make bread because I'm like, Who, how the hell do you compete with the big guys on bread? But I figured out a way to make a product that nobody else was too old up to make. And, and, and they would have to reverse engineer it. And, you know, most of those big guys, they don't really have somebody like that on staff so um they just kind of swallow up smaller companies as a rule so i um anyway i i took my bread i used scientific method you know i used i learned every design principles reverse engineering and then you know creativity to develop dips for the bread and i took it to a farmer's market and uh kind of the rest is history you know Dave, can I ask you, can I, go, I want to go back to the, you're, you're in, you're in prison. You're a couple years into that last stint 
before the bread company would take off and you, you drop that kite, that must've been like, you'd never asked for help before. It doesn't sound like in your life. And that must've been a really pivotal moment where you decided to ask for help. Like, how did you, where did that courage come from to, to decide, like, I'm just going to, I'm going to do this. I'd say, you know, that's a great question. And it's really the pivotal moment. Um, you know, the depression and the anxiety and the misery, misery and the suicidal thoughts, you know, I, I, I decided I really couldn't take myself out. Somehow I just never could quite do that. And that's, there's another story there too, but, uh, I was about three, three and a half years into it, into that sentence. And uh, it took me maybe, who knows how long it took me to finally say, well, you know what, I don't give a rat's but what people will say or think or do here, um, I don't have to be a tough guy anymore. Um, I could care less what anybody thinks. And it was like great um, light went on. Even before... I put the kite in, but when I put the kite in, it was like almost something came over me. Like, wow, I just did something. I can't take it back now. And, uh, it was, it was, it was a moment of humility that gave me courage. The humility is what gave me courage in my life. Acceptance gave me courage. Uh, once I realized I was okay with being who I was and I was starting right where I am and not pretending to be a tough guy or anything else, uh, it was just the beginning of a new life for me. It, it would seem like that, I don't know, that setting aside of your ego, that, that kind of willingness to, to ask for help. I mean, that, that extended then to, to that relationship with your brother when you, when you left, right? I mean, that must have been another kind of humbling experience to, to go back to him and say, hey, I'd like to, I feel like I've got something to add to the family business here. Like, I'm essentially yeah. you take me back, right? Like, talk mm -hmm. for a second about that. I mean, was that another kind of humbling experience, right? Well, that would have never happened had I not discovered that humility and acceptance, uh, which gave me courage. I was like, um, I knew I had to swallow my pride and go back to a business that I never thought I would consider again. You know, my brother and I were estranged and everything. Um, it didn't seem like it could ever happen. And then I had the transformation in prison and then it was an opportunity that was available. And uh, I had to start at the bottom, you know? And so I knew that I was like willing to, I was living in my mom's garage. Thankfully my mom had a garage that, that I could live in. Um, Cause some people have a really hard time finding a place to live. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of things was, I had to swallow my pride every day and just go do what I could do. It wasn't about pride. It, it, humility was something I latched onto and learned to love and appreciate. Uh, so it's something I still value very much in my life. And yet I'm not always humble. I mean, that's not what it's about. Uh, it's about uh, the, the attitude of humility, the attitude of gratitude and, uh, and, and acceptance of the new situation, but not ever being satisfied. The less satisfied you are, uh, uh, you know, the, you got to be hungry or, or not, you know, it's really up to you. Uh, you well, know, I just that, heard in there acceptance, but you're yeah. just saying you didn't, you didn't accept where you were all of a sudden. You didn't say, Oh, forget it. I'm a prisoner. This, this is my life. This is who I'm going to be. It was acceptance of, okay, this is where I am. And I have the power to actually change that now and do something. Yes. And that's another real big key. You know, and I'm sure you guys know this, but uh, for me, learning that I had the power, finally, no excuses, no blame. I have the power all of a sudden. And I'm like, wow, that's a great feeling. And can, again, you're humble enough, accepting enough. You're, the power is real because you're actually being exactly who you are to the best of your ability. And when you accept, when I accepted that, it grounded me and gave me a, a starting point where I felt like the sky was the limit. And that's when I, <clears throat> I didn't expect Dave's Killer Brad to be immediately so successful. Uh, really didn't. I thought it would be bad. I, I mean, I thought I would make a few products that would, you know, contribute to the, the company bottom line and stuff. But, uh, 
you know, nobody saw that it was going to swallow up the rest of the of what was going on. And so my plan was just to get by and, you know, be a, a decent baker and make some money. Was that, was that your plan? Like coming out, you said like, I, I, it feels like you'd been a guy who really had never had kind of a vision of where you wanted your life to go or a plan for what you were doing. Right. And I mean, in many ways you were probably just trying to find that next score or whatever. Right. Like as you were a, a, a into the, do- the dope and the drugs. But, but did that, did having that plan as you came out of prison or something you wanted to be, was that a big force in kind of just setting you on a path? Yeah, I guess, you know, as a dope dealer and stuff, I mean, I'd always had these kind of long-term goals that ne- I never could get to where I, where I would raise enough money and, and have enough equipment that I could start a business that was legit, you know, and, and, and that. So, so I always had that sort of entrepreneurial mindset, but I, it didn't work when I was doing drugs. Uh, when I got out, I, there was, it was weird. Maybe I go back a few years in prison and I started having sort of dreams. I don't know if they're daydreams or actual dreams, but I remember thinking to myself, uh, I, I really have a story to tell, you know, I have, I, and I, I believe in myself and, uh, I really feel like, uh, I can be, not somebody that's better than others, but somebody who can be successful. It just I started envisioning success. It was sort of vague at the time. Because uh, at the time, I didn't really plan on even going back to the bakery. I planned on taking the drafting and just taking that route and see where it takes me. I want maybe be an engineer or something like that. Uh, I love it so much. So uh, what I did is I was able, you know, because I didn't, I, I could see how I could design a product, say a design, a piece of furniture or, or a house, um, and drafting. I just saw, you know, my potential that I could actually use the same sort of mindset to do anything. You know, you're designing your life every day. You, you know, what do you, do you envision yourself doing something? Uh, well, you have to design that, you know, and I designed, it with with CAD, you have to replicate something. I mean, generally, this was my way. I would replicate what was out there, say a chair. And uh, somebody wanted the chair to be a bit like this, you know, a certain way, but it was based on that chair I did. So I would draw that chair in 3D space, and then I would use all my commands to, you know, measure everything and, and, and all that, and I would make... Uh, I would use all the commands working with the person who wanted it a certain way. And then I would perhaps even make it better than they were thinking. Um, and that's what I envisioned myself doing with the bread. I, I didn't really see myself uh, doing all the things that I ended up doing, like telling my story every day for a year or two uh, to so many people being on so many media, uh, being in so many media situations over the years I mean, it's countless scores of... Uh, so, Dave, you, you... I mean, how many years overall did you end up spending incarcerated in one form or another? 15 years. Four, four separate times plus three, plus three months in uh, county. Okay, so you spent some time and then here you go and thankfully the family had the business to go back to. Um, you were able to, again... Uh, use some of that humility to be able to reach out to your brother with that opportunity to get back into it. Now, what well, your story is amazing, and, and we want to keep diving into it. One of the things I think is pretty amazing is that you guys then gave second chances to people because of the situation you were in. Talk a little bit about what that took to be able to then say, you know what, we're going to hire people that need that second chance to help them get where they're going funny that it came from the heart it just kind of naturally happened we didn't we didn't like set out going we're going to hire one third ex felons uh i don't think that's way to do it um uh, we started out you know I, because i had been successful this way and i uh and my family saw this too we started hiring uh, at first i hired a couple of friends and that was a mistake you know because uh, it's not your friends you are, unless they happen to be ready. Uh, you got you got to pick the people who have done the work, 
inside and really just need a hand up. Um, you can tell who you're talking to if, if you if you're paying attention and you right ask the right questions. So we there there came a point where you know there was a temp agency we were doing all our hires through for about because we went from 50 employees to 100 employees in like two months, uh, which is just ridiculous, right? Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, you need an HR person. I mean, it was it was. And the HR person ended up being getting strung out on drugs because she met one of the ex felons uh, that was working there, and they both went off. Um, he was, but see, there's problems that happen. You know, I and my buddies they kind of screwed me, uh, and it, it, so we made mistakes at first. But eventually, uh, you know, I always believed that there was lots of people, good candidates, were not just good workers but great workers because they're grateful you know they, they're they're this is their second chance and they often will be just amazing so in, in can go back for a second to that cad the cad experience because i feel like that unleashed something in you right like that idea that, that wow i could be good at something and i could do something with, with this was there a person that like was running that program that became a mentor to you or like, why did that, why did you just grab onto that? So, so strongly. Well, it was, it was an awakening in my life. There was no particular person. I did have my, I guess you would say friends in there that we kind of gave each other support. <clears throat> um, but no, I never had this really great teacher mentor type individual, but I, uh, I guess, you know, I mean, I studied, I was sincere about my growth and about what I want to do. And yet I was pretty lighthearted too. And I was really enjoying the, uh, the work. I just, I just never realized that I could be so happy enjoying a process of, of learning and, uh, and the humility, which is such a big part of that. So I was able to take that and uh, I, I just knocked it out of the park and it made me go. And then, then when I got out of the bakery, uh, a lot of people didn't believe in me or thought, you know, they saw me making mistakes and they thought that defined me. Uh, I never, I, the more people gave me a hard time, the more I realized I was, uh, I'm, I'm on the right track. It's funny because I, because I started trusting my own instincts, uh, in a new environment like the bakery and everything that was going on there. So it was a process and it was like a one, like one great thing after another, but there was something inside me that I can't even say I, that when did it happen? What, what day did it happen? I don't know, but it was a process of a combination of those, the medication, education and humility. Um, that's, I think that gave me courage. Courage to do so much. I mean, courage to change your life. I mean, here you were again, on, on a wrong path, as, as society would say. Courage to reach out to your brother, who you said you were estranged with. Courage to then be able to not just take bread. I mean, bread, like I said at the beginning, I mean, we don't really think about bread all that much. But Dave, you then took bread and made it awesome. I mean, you made bread something. How do, how do you take bread and, and yeah. make that better? Well, that's a great question. Um... I guess all my life, you know, growing up in a bakery, I had maybe a little bit of a head start, but I didn't have the mindset for creating the breads that I ended up having from all the experiences that I had, especially the cat, the computer that drafted. That was such a mind opener for me. It was like, basically, you, be you begin with the end in mind. You have to start with a uh, with an item or, or with a product that's already existing, you know, I mean. I've never made a product that didn't, I, I didn't invent a product. I innovated one, I would say. We call uh, that R&D. Yeah, rip off yeah. and duplicate. Right, that's, that's what right. we do. Yeah. And what'd you call it? Rip off and duplicate. We <laughs> R&D things yeah. like that. So. Uh, but then yeah. we change them, right? We change that's them right. we 20% change a to bit. make them a little bit better. But, you know, yeah. you made bread, right? The recipe for bread's been around since for we a long time. Human, basically. <laughs> well, it was an interesting dynamic that... Uh, I couldn't just go out and use a, a, a bread baking book and create something like what everybody else was making, or it wouldn't have, there would have been no differentiation. Right? Uh, so I, uh, 
I actually went on a path that wasn't in the books. And I used scientific method. I would do five. Well, once I, I would do five batches or, or three, depending with a, <clears throat> with a control and a couple variables. And uh, I, at first, it was just to replicate other products that were out there. And then, and I, and I got to admit, I was scared to death that I couldn't do this. You know, even though I had some success, success with things in the past, I really thought this was a tough assignment. Well, hold on. Were you putting it out there to people that you were like doing this and that you were scared of like the failure of it, Dave? Or you just, or, or you were doing this in secret and you were just scared yourself of failing? Yeah, I was, I was, I was. And I wouldn't call it scared per se. That's probably the wrong word, but just a little bit like, okay, not sure I could do it, you know? Okay. And that, and, but if I couldn't do it, I would do something anyway. Something would happen because of the, of the work I was doing. I knew I would, I would create stuff. It just, I didn't expect it to happen so fast. But, the, but I really, the thing is that it was like two months from the time I started this project to the time I had my, my killer bread, my first variety of killer bread ready to go. And uh, again, it was scientific method. And I took what I thought was the best bread that was out there in my category. And I just, uh, I tried to, I, I came pretty close to replicating it. It's impossible to be exact. I mean, I think, but I, I, I'm like, this is, this is what they're making. I see what makes it good. Uh, now I know how to make it better you know, because I understood it and it had nothing. You, you would go to a book, right? A baking book with all the science and all that stuff. I would read that stuff and none of it applied to what I was doing. So it was interesting is, but I was really good at the trial and error and a lot of uh, trial and error is a big deal. You know, you, so there's a lot of flavors out there that never made it to the grocery store and Dave's killer bread as you were going through trial and error. Sure. They weren't, uh, they, they were okay. You know, at first I was making bricks. Honestly, I just didn't, I didn't even know my ass was the only ground or came out. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just, uh, but, and, and I, I, I kind of felt people snickering around me, you know, this guy, oh, he comes back from prison. He's going to be just this laughing stock or whatever. He's not that smart. You know, that, that motivates you. Actually it did. Yeah. Uh, because it didn't bother me. It really didn't bother me. The, the only thing that bothered we, we did. We, my family and I fought like cats and dogs, worse than uh, almost so bad that uh, we weren't going to make it just because of that. Uh, and we were we had this opportunity that was unreal. By the time we were we, we'd been fighting for a while, and but we had this opportunity that somehow we had to had to uh, had to make happen. And we finally got a, uh, somebody called a family business shrink. You know, that's what we called him, a, a business advisor, a family business advisor. And he helped us kind of say, well, you guys hate each other, but at least, you know, you can agree on these two things that'll get you to the next point, you know? And that's kind of what we did. We just stayed away from each other and realized that we could, Every once in a while, something great would happen and we'd celebrate together, you know. So it would be like, you got into Costco. That was like, that was a celebratory moment. And know? that's where that, Bob first discovered you. After I mentioned this interview coming up on our calendar, Bob said, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I can't stop seeing your bread now, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. And uh, my old lady, my, my wife, I just married, got married this year. My wife. Uh, Congrats, she, by the way. Yeah, she was, we've been together 12 years, but uh kind of you know finally decided to get married and then uh she today she said she saw a great big you know a semi truck with with wonder on one side wonder bread on one side days to the bread on the, on the other side <laughs> <laughs> because because flowers the company that bought that bought days to the bread is now um is you know they also do wonder they bought wonder as well okay. so i want to i want to talk about that dave you, you build this you, you take the family business which had been doing okay, right? I mean, it had been around for a while. It wasn't anybody was retiring on this. It wasn't, you come along, you bring your now newfound belief in yourself, your newfound humility, your newfound courage. You create Dave's Killer Bread. I mean, you make these flavors, you make this product that just 
blows up everywhere and becomes this bread. You, and again, you, you, your company becomes one of doing good by hiring a third of your workforce being uh, felons, you know, to give yeah. them that second chance, which is just a fantastic story. I mean, supporting your company just because it would have done that. Now, all of a sudden, you sell the company. But, yeah. but, let's, but let's go back because the Dave who got himself in lots of trouble is still in there. And now yeah. all of a sudden, someone hands you this large check, I've got to imagine, when they say, we're buying your company, here's a whole bunch of money, go away, right? We're taking your company. I don't know if you well, have anything at all with it. Uh, well, at first, we sold half the company in 2012. Okay. And so you sold was- part of the company, so they gave you a, a half a big check, and you still had some input into the company, and you were yeah. still doing your thing, and then you finally got to a point where you're not day-to-day involved with the company, and you've got... How do you stay true to the new Dave and not all of a sudden fall back into the habits that the old Dave had with all this freedom that's now afforded to you? Well, I never, I never was tempted to go back to methamphetamine, uh, but I was drinking with, um, like celebrating a lot. You know, I, I was successful in my life. You know, I, I was a millionaire, but not like I ended up being. Um, I, I wasn't worried about money, uh, but I cared. I still cared about the company, but slowly but surely things were happening and it made me feel like I was losing my baby, you know. Things, I, mistakes I was making that, you know, with our new partners and stuff, basically all they could see is, is my knuckleheadness rather than the great, the great things I did. So it, it started getting, it, it was, it compounded. It got worse and worse and drinking and, uh, situations happened. I could, I could go into a long story there, uh, but there was no criminal activity whatsoever other than, you know, if you'd want to call drinking, <laughs> but, uh, I was legally drinking and not doing other drugs. And, uh, I had a driver, you know, so it made it, it was, I was enabled, you know, to continue this. And, uh, eventually, it was, I never really changed my attitude, and I still was speaking. I spoke, and then I'd go drink. I would have, I was speaking all the time. I spoke hundreds of times uh, to people, and then I would go celebrate. Sometimes I'd have a, a couple shots before I did my speech, and I would knock it out of the park. <laughs> it's like, but so everything just seemed like it was going okay, and then until it wasn't, and. Long story short, the company and I became uh, sort of at odds, uh, and I I took a sabbatical, and stuff happened on the sabbatical, and I eventually quit drinking for about five or six weeks. My my old lady says it was about that long, and uh, I didn't recognize it, but I was getting more and more a little bit freaked out mentally, and. I was still in a very creative mode. I was writing a lot, but I was writing these very long things that I don't even know what I was saying anymore. But uh, then I finally one day, I had been banished from the company. I couldn't even go to my my own company anymore and walk around. Uh, You know, I just, because of my mental state, I think that that's what happened. And I finally, uh, you know, one day, decided, well, screw you. I'm, go- I'm going to the company. I'm going there anyway. You know, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. And I'm going to say hi to everybody. Walked in there, saw some people, you know, hey, how's it going? I was going through this kind of talking crazy. I know that now. But then I went back into the storefront where we sell the, you know, the stales and the whatever. And there's a cardboard cutout of myself that was six feet, about the same height, height as me. And I'm like thinking to myself, this guy can be here, but I can't. And I'm like, that's screwy. And so I punched him, you know, I punched, I punched the cardboard cutout. Yeah. <laughs> so that kind of destroyed the cardboard cutout, and, um, which I never liked anyway. I just felt it was weird. So I, <laughs> so anyway, I punched it out and that just freaked everybody out. So um, they ended up, calling the cops on me, you know, they didn't really, the cops couldn't really do anything because, you know, 
my own company, a bunch of my own picture, you know, but uh, they, they were there and they tried to talk to me. And I said, you know, I, I ain't talking to you. I'm out of here. I don't have anything to say to you. So I left. And then that day just got worse and crazier and just insane. My mind totally went off. I became psychotic by, by the evening. And I tried to leave a friend's house with my, with my Escalade. And they tried to stop me, but what they did is they had called, they had called the, the you know, psychiatric local uh, mental um, health department and they said they'd be there but they're on uh they're on what do you call it uh, they're on a, on a break right now and they wouldn't be available for a couple hours and so they ended up calling the cops on me and thinking the cops would just kind of take me to the hospital or something right but instead uh i freaked out i tried to get away i guess i don't know because i'm mental i can't remember my mental state and they they crashed we crashed I crashed into three cop cars before it was all said and done. And uh, that became a a major problem for me um, that I had to deal with. And then, you know, I ended up I'm still on supervision for that. And because uh, I I'm a mental patient who's uh, released to the streets. That's the deal. So now um, and that's for a long time. So now I now I uh, it took me a little while, like quite a while to come out of that mental state. You know, not the psychotic one, but the hypomanic state that I got into. And there's a lot more stories about it, but I eventually evened out by sometime the next year, and I've been on a good path ever since. You, um, you, you, your, your story is one of resilience to me. Of just like never giving up on yourself, of um, like today, as you sit here, Dave, and you look back, is there anything you'd change? Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, I, I believe in life's lessons. It's great to learn from life's lessons, but if I, I if I could go back and change that incident, I would do it. I mean, it's really, it really messed with my life, but obviously, you know, there's the other side of it that says, if that happened, it needed to happen, you know, and I made it happen. So you know, I wasn't the only force that made it happen, but it was, it was my impact on life that made that happen and choices that I made. So those are choices that were, I guess, to, to a person who a lot is provided and given, a lot is expected, yeah. you know, and, and I, I didn't step up to the plate for everything I should have, so. You know, I'm hearing a lot of that humility and the acceptance in there that you were talking about earlier, right? You're being very humble about it and, and taking the responsibility and accepting what happened. Yeah, because if you accept what happened and you take responsibility, that gives you power. You know, people don't understand that, that that's a oxymoron or something, but it does. It gives you power to change your life. So I do that all, I, every day. I kind of go through a battle with myself. Well, how much am I working today? Or, you know, how much am I really going to focus on this particular thing today? Uh, that's actually not, that actually takes discipline. There's the easy stuff and there's the discipline stuff. And, you know, so I still work on myself. What are you working on these days? So you're, you're not, you're not actively involved with the, the bread anymore that you made that a success and it's been, it's launched off. What are you working on these days or what are you up to? What do you, what do you, what's your time spent on? Well, I start I, in 2015 after I sold the last part. We sold the last part of the company. I was able to. Uh, I I discovered eBay and uh, Amazon. Next thing you know, I'm buying these masks. I love I love these masks that I was buying and putting them on my wall. They're like ethnic uh, like war African masks. African like tribal masks, masks and stuff like that. At first, it was just different ethnicities, but I I finally settled on African art as my favorite and. I went off the hook on it and I have thousands. I now have a 15,000 square foot warehouse that I, I built with uh, many thousands of, of pieces of African art. And I have a company called Discover African Art that uh, we're mostly a uh, wholesale on the, on the internet, wholesale uh, 
I'd say we're in a constant state of uh, liquidation, you know, and <laughs> where we're at now. And we don't, I don't make any money on it, but I, I have people that are, that make their living on it and I enjoy, I enjoy it. So uh, eventually that process led me to a much, much bigger understanding of African art and, and, and everything about it. And so now I have pieces in my house that are just phenomenal, um, high level, high end pieces. And then I have a lot of things, lower end stuff that I sell. So, uh, so that's my, that's one thing I do. And then, um, occasionally I, I do a speech. I don't like, I, I, I very rarely want to do a speech anymore. It's kind of, uh, too much work for me, you know, <laughs> uh, but I, I have, uh, video people, movie people. Yeah. I should say one group is doing, I've signed for, to do a uh, documentary and another group. I am looking at Hollywood type, you know, production. So who who would play Dave? Come on, if you, if you're going Hollywood, who who would you want to play Dave? I would pick Bradley Cooper. There you go. Oh, yeah. all right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, he yeah. plays a role. He plays that role. What's the movie he plays with um, with Lady Gaga? That that's That's, that's yeah. the reason. From watching that, I'm like, yeah. oh, this guy, this guy can do it. I can Which totally remake. Like, he, he, remake. I can see him look at like, he, he, I can see that. That's a, that's a good pick. That's All right. right. So Dave, as, as we come to the end of this opportunity to hear your story and, and have you share it with, with our audience and your message that's in there and all that, leave our audience with a 30 second, one minute. What's the message you truly want everyone to walk away from this hearing from you that they could learn today? Okay. You can be your own worst critic. There's nothing wrong with that. I am. Uh, but forgive yourself. You know, forgive whatever's in the past is in the past. Learn from the past. Discover humility. Accept who you are today. But don't be satisfied. And realize that you are the one that has the power to change. And you're the one that has the power to make a difference in the world. Uh, you, you can't depend on anybody else and you're not a victim and you don't owe, you don't, you don't owe anybody what they are trying to tell you that you owe them. Uh, you just, you just gotta be, you gotta stand on your own and kick ass. That's awesome. We appreciate you sharing that today, Dave, with everybody. Folks, if you haven't tried Dave's Killer Bread, he might not be running it anymore, but he made it for you. So go out there and try yourself some Dave's Killer Bread. The stuff is fantastic. It's all over North America. Yeah, you'll, you'll find it in lots and lots of places out there. That's for sure. Bob can't stop seeing it now. It's in so, my local Woodenville Costco. I walk by it once a week. Love it. There you go. So, gang, don't only share Dave's Killer Bread with people. Share the episode where we got the pleasure of talking and learning from Dave himself with people. You could share the podcast. Just have yep. people text the word podcast to 59559. That's 59559. Text the word podcast and they'll be able to subscribe just like that. It'll be sent right to their inbox. They'll have access. They can also visit winmakegive.com to see what's going on. And until our next episode, on behalf of everybody, we want to thank Dave for joining us. Thank you for listening. Remember, wash those hands and as always, do good. Do good.